so to get this right, Phil Davis, um, he to, to the outside world, he's 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 considered the leader of the movement. He may not be in the action movement. He, he but, would be, cons- but to an outside observer, that would be the simplest explanation. Okay, and he's a former chocolatier. I have so many questions about Phil Davis. <laughs> You should have him on something. I'll, I'll answer everything that I can about Phil. Okay, so can you get him on. Who's Phil Davis? He's- so I, I've done, I've done um, about four hours of interview with Phil. He's somebody that I consider a brother. Phil is somebody who openly teaches about going through the experiences to receive the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost, how that led him to receive his second comforter experience, literally brought into the presence of Jesus Christ in His glory. Um, so he, he talks about he talks about that rather so openly. Does that make him a prophet in your estimation? Well, so I I ask him that in my interviews of him, and of course in his voice you'll hear Phil. No, I'm just a man who believes that they that, who knows that they what the Book of Mormon teaches is true. It means that he claims to have the witness of Jesus Christ, the same kind that's that's talked about by by John the Revelator and others. What I rec- what I personally recognize from him, he's got a mandate from Jesus. To cry repentance, kind of like the preparatory stages. He does not have authorization to say, the Lord has called me into his presence and told me to tell you guys this. He has not had that same experience as Lehi, even though I believe his testimony regarding Jesus Christ. So last podcast, okay. uh, we, we did ask if uh, if anybody in your movement had one of those experiences. And it sounded like you said no. There's a, there's a few people who I know have. Okay. In other words, here's the main thing that people focus on. And, and it is appropriate to call it a movement because I don't know what else to call it. But if there's if there's <laughs> anybody, well, let me point this out. If there's anybody who starts to puff themselves up as people should be drawn to me, it is incredibly distasteful. It's recognized as not being from the Lord and it, and it doesn't go very far. And, and I'm grateful for that. And I think because people are generally, they consider them, they use terms like, waking up. I've woken up. My my eyes have been opened. Terms like that get used. And I think because of that, there's a significant aversion to the hierarchical structure that we're so familiar with. Okay. I mean, I, I agree with that to a certain extent. I also realize that I think sometimes we've adopted the language of our s- worldly oppressors yeah. by viewing the church as a corporate hierarchy. That's almost adopting corporatism. To me, it's a sucky job being called to be bishop. It's not awesome. Yeah. You have to serve and be responsible for the, the the spiritual well-building of 500 people, maybe only 150 of which <laughs> regularly show up, and of those 50, only 50 are useful. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, to me, it's like not like, oh, yeah, dude, I'm bishop. Th- those boneheads, there's like a couple in Southern California. They're, they're not at the level where they get financially compensated for their time. And the financial compensation that most of them are getting is a pay cut for what they were doing before, you know? Like, yeah, like I have I, friends that were like executives was, at NBC that yeah. retired let me ask you this. into working I, at the church. I, I, have a friend, I have a friend who does high-end construction, and he continues to build second and third homes for general authorities. How common do you believe it is for general authorities to become much more wealthy after representing the church full-time? First off, what do you mean by general authorities? Do you mean the 12? Because that's a pay cut in general, in my opinion, for most of those cats. I've yep. seen it myself. And I also, we all know how much they make. They make about 120 k which is just barely above the economic threshold, uh, the economic stress threshold in California. Uh, 120 grand is what like a high school do, do, administrator Do you want their finances here. to be the topic? Because I, I think we should, if we do that one on a different episode, I think well, yeah, it would glad be fun to bring out the, the verifiable about. known information Regarding okay. finances, because well, I want to talk about Phil and the chocolate. Well, yeah, right. so let's <laughs> talk about Phil and the chocolate. I, I, Get back I, to the chocolate. One of the factory. best dates well, of my life. And I can do I can do Phil's voice very well. Well, I can do oh. Donald Chokes' voice very well. Mm-hmm. One of the best dates of my life was I I took her to Taste on Provo University Avenue, and it was so great. She was like, "This is such a cool place." A couple years later, I'm looking on Twitter and I see Christina Rossetti makes a tweet about. A, the, the new QAnon Mormon prophet, Phil <laughs> Davis. That's, and I'm like, what's going on? I look, it's like the chocolatier prophet. And I'm like, what is going? And I just woken up too, so I was like, you know, you just wake up, you're like, wow, let's get, what's what going is on? This? 
so to get this right, Phil Davis, um, he to, to the outside world, he's 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 considered the leader of the movement. He may not be in the actual movement. He, he but, would be, cons- but to an outside observer, that would be the simplest explanation. Okay, and he's a former chocolatier. Yeah, he still does it hobby-ish, no longer okay. professionally. Um, and he said that he had a, a, he was taken to the presence of the Lord and saw Christ. Is this face to face? Is this like astral projection? Is this like so? I'll I'll let you know this. So in the I did a four part interview with him, and I really try to be dutiful in asking the questions Rock on. that it, that that any skeptical person would want to ask. You guys can judge me whether I did a good job of that or not. Okay. Having I've been on road trips with him before, extended periods of time, just he and I alone in the car. When I would ask him about these things, and let me just go back some of my interest in it. When I was a young missionary. I'd become emotional at the thought of meeting one of the quorum of the 12, because then I would finally actually know somebody that knows Jesus. And that was so important to me because I wanted to know Jesus so much as a young missionary. And I still do now. Okay. I'm in the car with Phil and there's none of that sort of spiritual rock star elevation in my mind towards him. I consider him a brother, but I don't consider him in charge of me or the Lord expects me to view him as in charge of me or anybody else. When I would probe him on those questions, for example, he gives the account of baptism, fire of the Holy Ghost, and later um, being instructed to build an altar in the woods, kneeling down, praying, fire coming down. The building that he went to, I was able to spend 90 plus minutes saying, what was the level of light like? Was it fuzzy, zooming in and out, kind of dreamlike, fast moving from one thought to another? And he's like, no. It was, it was what seems like a, a continual stream, like the space-time continuum that you and I are going through right now. Could you touch the walls? What did it feel like? Yes, you could touch it. It's every bit as real. The way, Phil, the way that I'm – and then when he talks about being pulled up in a column of light where it feels like jumping out of an airplane but in reverse going up. And, the, and when he talks about – he talks about um, when I had seen Jesus Christ in visionary experiences before, his face would always be shrouded because of his glory. In this moment, I watched as he came into focus. And then I asked, Phil, right now I, I, can, I can observe the lines around your eyes. And if I wanted to spend enough time, I can start counting your whiskers. Was it that level of definition? He says, it was more real than looking at you right now. And, um, and I asked, okay, well, what about pictures that I see on the wall? Do those get close? And, and here was one of the eye openers for me because I'm trying to ask and, and, and I even on different parts, I, I, I deliberately switch up my questions so he couldn't have predicted them beforehand. But here's some of the more predictable stuff. The paintings that we see, he says, he points to one that's inside of his room. He says, that's a fair approximation. But the level of glory that you experience in that. And, and he explains, this is why somebody has to receive the baptism of fire of, and of the Holy Ghost beforehand, because it's the sanctification that prevents you from, from uh, being obliterated by his glory. He says, the level of glory being in his presence, you feel like all your elements are going to melt away. And so you're not focused on counting beard hairs or being jovial. And, and one of the things that he distinguishes, he talks about astral projection a lot because he knows plenty of people that do it. It's becoming more and more common these days. He says, there is nothing chummy about it. Anybody who shares an experience with you where it's like he was the neatest person or explains it jovial or how I like to say chummy, that is a deception from the adversary. You are filled with such a complete awareness. And I'm, I'm doing his voice with a complete awareness of your own nothingness and of his purity, and of his greatness. And there's nothing else that's on your mind other than recognition of that. Now, I compare that. There's somebody that I don't know who it is from the sounds of his story. I read his story, and then I heard it online. It sounds like he grew up in California. I'm going to give the incredibly short version of his meeting of Jesus. He went through years of dedicating his life, overcame addictions and other things. He has his own uh, furniture store. But when he had been praying for years because he felt like, hey, I really want to meet Jesus. And he felt that was a good thing to pray for. And it had been a continual prayer for a while. When it happened to him, some of the things leading up to it, he was in his furniture store and was told, lay down. And he recognized the spirit. He's like, why do I lay down? And the spirit says to him sternly but lovingly, you will lay down or I will knock you down. Oh, okay. And he lays down on the bed that was available in his furniture store after hours. He describes a being taken up experience. 
And he had a similar sort of um, description to where it was more real than the world that I know. He became aware of this pure source of light in the distance. And he instantly became aware that it was the Savior. And he was instantly and inescapably aware of his own dirtiness and nothingness. And he realized this was a bad idea. I shouldn't have done it. He would, didn't want any of his own dirtiness to, to somehow rub off on this pure light. And he talks about getting down into the fetal position, trying to cover his head and his hands until this perfect light is now in front of him. And, it's, and he sees him through his skull. In other words, this perfect pure light permeates everything. And he went through experiences where he was told to touch the nails in his feet and in his side and other things. Now, that's another experience to where, where as I prayed, I, I felt the spirit burning with my own personal desire to know the Savior, but I believed this man's testimony. Some of the things that I recognize are in common is there was big preparation leading up to somebody receiving it, and even when it happens, it is preceded by a sanctification, and even after the sanctification, somebody is acutely aware of their own eternal insignificance in comparison to the Savior. Well, I mean, to me that makes sense uh book of moses talks about you know i realized this read, man for this was, cause i know that man is nothing which thing i had never supposed thing i never supposed so okay that's cool all so, of this is fine and dandy yeah i guess i just don't get your movement and we've agreed that it's it, it, fair to call it a movement sure. is gaining attention yeah. okay and what's that thing that's gaining attention um and and can i ask a related question uh, yeah. it's um how does this relate to like denver snuffer i i've heard i don't think i've, I've never met him in person uh -huh. um it's not related to any of the movement of denver snuffer it's common enough i would say as much as five percent of the people that i end up associating with in through the doctrine of christ circles may have been a part of the snuffer movement at some time the general opinion and there's no official opinion on denver snuffer but the general opinion is he has not met Jesus. Um, I, I actually like him. He, he's got a solid Denver snuffer has a notable command of the scriptures and of church history. Um, I think he's a good dude. I do not believe he has any mandate from Jesus. Uh, okay. But he's, for his he's not a leader of your movement. Okay. okay yeah. Cool, so not I really related. Um, no, Back no to not at all. The, the, the general so, opinion but is. I, I don't get, so obviously there's some kind of contention between this movement and the mainstream movement because of something yeah. that the new movement is doing. All right. And it's leading to the excommunication of a lot of people. Is and, this being recorded or is this just. Banter? Oh no, this is all recorded. This is all bonus oh, oh, materials. Oh, dude, I, I went off for a while. Oh yeah. Well, no, it was great. It was fine. This became more human for some reason. Keep going. So, um, what is what is the con t contention? Uh, I mean, does somebody have to renounce belief that Russell M. Nelson is? A I don't think all prophets are created well, equal. I mean, so let me finish. I don't think okay. all prophets are created equal, and why? Not because I'm trying to make an excuse to get along with the guy with the great beard on my radio program. Yeah, but well, because, you've already got one in person with you. Yeah, um, <laughs> but because I've read the Book of Mormon. And I've read the book of Omni, where they go through like eight generations of mediocre prophets. Some of them at least humble enough to say, yeah, I wasn't that great of a prophet. They, they, they aren't calling them prophets. They kept the records, but the book of Mormon doesn't refer to any of them as prophets. Lehi doesn't refer to himself as a prophet. Nephi doesn't refer to himself as a prophet. Enos, any of the others, they don't refer to themselves. Some of them okay, do testify. Jonah, Jonah of self, Jonah yeah. self effaced oh. as saying... Uh, you know, he had sinned and even done bad things that I I, yeah. I assume would be considered su sinful that would lose the mandate that you spoke of he, earlier. He totally was an authorized record keeper. Jonah was an authorized record keeper. Okay, cool. So, um, was it what is it that's making people? What is it that's causing the contention between you and mainstream Mormonism? Um, it, as far as I. <laughs> I can't speak on behalf of, of and I'm, I'm going to put a qualifier. I'm not continuing to use this term to be insulting. I believe it's accurate. I can't speak on behalf of the corporate corporate structure church. I do know that this narrative that, that has been reemphasized of an unbroken line of succession, understanding a different history brings that perception of power to an end. In other words, if 
those who ended up filling the first presidency in the first generation after the assassination of Joseph Smith were directly involved in the assassination of Joseph Smith, the the line of succession instantly falls apart. So, so this is what just came to came to my mind. I think that you're right. Like 99% of what you've said, I've agreed with. And that if a church has to maintain its authority through a fantastic narrative that's not based on A, truth, and B, personal experience yeah. and personal relationship with God, then it's not doing God, the, the mandate yeah. of a church from God. Let, okay, let I get me, that. Let me give you... But I, I've oh. never felt that that's what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that you call the corporate church has yeah. done. And I guess my only wariness with the other... I agree with 90%, but the other 10% that I don't agree with, and the reason why I kind of look like that sometimes, is because when dealing on the opposite side with anti-Mormons, I'm constantly told that, well, the church teaches this, and I'm fed a straw man of a church that I don't know, never experienced, yeah. but I feel like I have to say yes yeah. to and believe just to get along with this person. It's like, I don't have to love Donald Trump to know that he didn't say there's very good people on both sides. Yeah. Like I can just objectively go back and look at the tapes and realize, okay, that's just a straw man argument by people that hate him. So I feel like it's a straw man argument by people that generally hate the church. I don't know if it's based on yeah. jealousy of power I've, or, or I would what. Say I've always loved the church intensely. Okay. I've dedicated my life to it. And here's just a little bit of my background. I had a come to Jesus moment at age 15. I was involved in um, in low level organized crime, getting in vans with others, breaking into bowling alleys and grocery stores, stealing booze and supplying and bootlegging at parties. Low level crimes. We even call so ourselves the So what are the statute of limitations mafia. on any of these? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it, it led me to a brick wall in my life early on before I was 16 years old, I recognized hearing the voice of the Lord, like simple, simply giving me the instructions, Jacob, since you've changed from those ways, you've had an increase of light and let me know you're on the path that you need to be on. I knew that it was the voice of the Lord specifically, because I remember sitting on my bed and how clear these instructions were uh, apart from my own mind. I also realized I could try to justify that that it wasn't from God, but I knew full well I'd be held accountable for it. I had a few sacred experiences since then leading up to me being a missionary where I heard the voice of the Lord. As a young missionary, 20 years old in Ames, Iowa, I had, and, and this is something that took about two months of preparation, carrying a prayer around in my heart in preparation for it. I had been praying to understand the atonement and I felt that desire starting to burn every single day. It led to me going to bed a little bit earlier around Christmas times in Ames, Iowa, the university town. There was four of us missionaries in the apartment. We were hard working. We got along real well. And I simply went to bed a few minutes earlier than the rest of them for no particular reason. I knelt down and I started to pray. And it was almost instantly that I was carried away in a visionary experience. And in that experience, I saw the Savior Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I not only witnessed a portion of what he sacrificed on my behalf, I could feel my body fully permeated with the outpouring of love of him towards me. And I heard words that he said as he pled specifically on my behalf. My testimony at that point changed from, I believe these things are true because I could sincerely say that and the spirit would be there as I tell investigators, I believe these things are true. I recognize the spirit. Tell me these things are true. I could now on certain subjects, I could testify, I know the Savior Jesus Christ lives. I know that his atonement is real. And the Spirit would be there to, to emphasize that. So I, the church has been the catalyst in many ways in my trajectory and my determination to actually return to the presence of the Lord in this life the way that we're instructed to in the temple endowment. Okay. All right. So, um, whoo. I feel like uh, I need a cold shower and a dip yeah. in the pool because this just, has been a, just, just bathe in Purell. This has been a lot. This Who's been, a been lot. sponsoring this podcast? The, no, no, <laughs> I, not, not that I need to sterilize. I'm saying I need to cool down, man. That was intense. Yeah. So, um, all right. How can people reach you if they want to know more about your heretical? I mean, your interesting <laughs> new um, move. I'm totally just kidding with you, bro. No, no you're um, totally fine. How I, can I, I people like meet you? How can they, 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 cause look, I'll tell you as much right now. I believe 
that uh, I, you should always challenge the institution because if the institution is strong, it will stand and you will just be sharpened. Jesus your, certainly did it. You'll just sh sharpen your blade by bouncing up against it. So um, how can what what's how can people check you out? Get to know you. And I, what you I, say um, more. I on a very consistent basis receive random friend requests on Facebook. Okay. If I receive one of those from somebody, I did the same thing to Quaku. Uh, I can be forgetful, period. To what do I owe the pleasure of your friend request? Question mark. Translation. Who the heck is you? OK, so um, I, I also do a YouTube channel called Disciple of Christ. And one of the main things I do on that channel is long form interviews of people who are on the path for lack of a different term. People who are going through the process right now of an influx of the spirit of their life, guiding them to receive the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost and continuing on that path. OK, is a requirement of that leaving the Mormon church? No, never. I, I would say I most commonly work with people who are active members of the church and have been their whole life huh. and feel a desire to be so. In, in other words, this is happening more and more frequently with active leadership at the very least on a local level throughout the United States. And I know some other parts of the country. OK, interesting. So mm -hmm. check him out on YouTube. Hit him up with random friend requests on Facebook. And and, and the, the meanest questions that you can think of. No, you can no, accuse me of beard nice. forgery and everything. Don't 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 be mean to me. He's a nice guy. We're going to invite you back to talk about your unscientific. I mean, your uh, unforensic. It, oh gosh, what are the what's the right word for that? Um, misguided. The, 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 the fraudery, the fakery. Of, <laughs> I heard it. I heard it referred to as. Uh, uh, poppycock. Your poppycock of the cartridge. Yeah, 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 your uh, your master's study in poppycockery. Yeah, the video where you took a couple of uh, you know forensic ballistic gelled skeletons in the desert and called it a science project. But um, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna check out that one. Uh, that one's a very interesting one. And, and all hyperbole aside, I do want to talk to you uh, because I thought you brought up some very interesting and compelling arguments in that video. We'd love to have you back. Um, thank with you very Justin, much. Justin, with Justin Griffin. Let's have Dude, both of them on. Yeah, bring here, Justin. Here's Griffin what on. I can do. Sure. On my end, I can actually get a get a camera happening to Justin and myself so we both have our own independent microphones. And I want it a Justin bit easier on your end. Justin like sounds like all my friends. He sounds who, like a bro. Who like I have to tell really him to talk louder that into this a microphone. Protein shake. Like He's a uh, my dude. muscles since He's consuming dude, this protein. All right, so we're going to have you back. Thank you very much. Everybody say goodbye. This is Midnight Mormons. See you guys in the next podcast. Wake you on his phone. <laughs> it's a girl. It happens All right, a lot. Catch you later, man. I got to get <laughs> the other guests we got in here. But we're going to have you back. Is that okay? I love it. Oh.